Atreil is charged into the mineshaft, moving with enough momentum that he staggered for several steps as he tried to stop. The slightly tilted red eyes squinted from beneath the brown forelocks of his shaggy hair, not fully adjusting from the rapid change from harsh afternoon sunlight to the dimness of the mines. Sweat dampened the skin of his brow, slicking the rings of tattoos around his left eye, making it as though a black spiderweb crept on his brow, cheek, and nose. The light of a single glowstone lit the shaft. Bent over with one hand on his knee, the other on the hilt of his longsword, Matreolus heaved three deep breaths, enough to steady his breathing and pulse. The alarm bell on the surface was still tolling out its deep warning ring, echoing loudly even into the tunnel. A glowstone on a minecart ahead provided the only light that didn't come through the entrance a hundred feet behind him. The white glow illuminated almost a dozen men, mostly terrified miners with wary eyes, clenching their tools as if they were weapons. A foreman was with them, less terrified than the rest, and that old man Tarval had beaten Matreolus to the response. Again. Out of breath already? Someone shouted. Kid, you just got here. Matreolus recognized the voice. Straightening himself out, he shot a glare over to Tarval. The old man had been waiting for him, the butt of his spear planted in the ground, his upper body leaning on the shaft. The dark did a lot to mask the gray in his hair. Tarval must have still been on patrol when the bells started sounding. His civil watch patch was still showing on his left sleeve. Stow it, old man, Matreolus growled. He turned to the foreman. Get them to stop ringing that damned alarm bell. We need to be able to actually hear down here. They're called whispers for a reason. The foreman motioned for one of his miners to do as Matreolus asked. That foreman was a portly fellow, one that Matreolus had seen a handful of times before. He wound up making an adequate replacement for the previous foreman. Matreolus gave a grim, mirthless chuckle thinking about what happened to that old man. Tarval could tell what Matreolus was thinking and gave him a cold glare. The old man's tolerance for Gallo's humor was low. The foreman cast a nervous and expectant look back towards the entrance through the tunnel. Are you the only two coming? Matreolus nodded. Anglin isn't going to make it. He's already drinking. The alarm bell outside ceased, but the foreman was still shouting over its echoes. But Anglin's... Anglin's not here, Matreolus cut in. And the last thing we need is a drunk swordsman. We've already got a drunk spearman to see this through. Tarval muttered, I've been sober most of the day. Rolling his eyes, Matreolus replied, Yeah, and that's water in your canteen. The old man doubled down on his frosty glare. Matreolus ignored it and turned back to the foreman. Now how bad of a deal is this? The foreman shifted nervously and quietly said, If half of what the men were saying was true, then it's the largest whisper anyone's ever seen. It must have crept from the main tunnels into this one. Just our luck that this shaft is a dead end so it's got nowhere to go but back out this way. Largest whisper anyone's ever seen. Matreola sighed and rolled his eyes. They say that every time. Every summons they had gotten contained those words. Most whispers they slayed were in the large range, sure, but few were anything worth being terrified of. The average whisper big enough to eat a miner was only the height of a horse, and perhaps four times as long. No reason for this one to be any different. Don't worry. We've got this entirely under control. Just get the usual amount ready for the Slayer's fee. Are, are you sure? Matreolus unsheathed the sword and brought it to rest on his shoulder, a position that he had figured to look impressive. As the blade moved, it just barely avoided contact with the walls and ceiling of the mine shaft. Yeah, I'm sure. We got this. Matreolus didn't notice the old man rolling his eyes. Tarval muttered something about Matreolus being a fool, as he stood up straight and pulled the butt of his spear out of the earth. I assume the normal precautions will be in place? Kenner's men are outside right now, Matreolus said, a full dozen of them with their crossbows shaking in their hands. Matreolus turned to look at the foreman. They'll be loosing at anything that comes out of these tunnels unannounced. Shout that you're coming out before you step into the light. The foreman turned to leave, motioning for his miners to follow him. Try not to die in here. I've had enough men go missing today. You've only lost one, Tarval grumbled. The foreman whirled around just long enough to say, one was too many. Matreola set off into the dark, dragging the minecart behind him by a thick iron chain that he hefted over one shoulder. Over the creaking of the wheels, he heard Tarval mutter, I wonder how long that attitude will last. Is something wrong with him giving a damn? 
Matreolus asked. He punctuated the question with a deep breath. Tarval got a few steps ahead of him, spear at the ready, his whole body coiled to lash out at whatever might come out of the receding darkness. Matreolus had lost count of how many times he had seen the old man in that position. Tarval's age might have been showing, but he was still perhaps the deadliest spear fighter anywhere within a hundred leagues of Cartfell. Tarval said, Those guildsmen don't stay that way very long. He might be on the optimistic side now, but he'll change. The guilds don't like idealists. They like people who work the guild's way, because the guild's way makes money, and the people that impede their ability to make money tend to disappear. Matreolus did not need to be reminded of that last part. It was only because they paid off Kenner that the Monster Slayers Guild had gotten no word of them acting freelance. Of course, I don't think Kenner would ever sell us out. He's too much of a coward to come into these tunnels himself, him and his men. Well, I kinda like him, Matreolus replied. He's not as arrogant as the last one. The old man made a noise halfway between a grunt and a chuckle. The irony of that coming from you. Hey, I'm not dumb enough to go gallivanting through these tunnels by myself, the lad countered. The previous foreman had been a stingy and pudgy fellow. A couple of whispers had started preying on the miners, and that old foreman had decided he would deal with them himself. He had gotten tired of paying monster slayers like Matreolus and Tarval for doing their jobs. He grabbed a posse of his biggest, meanest-looking men and set off to deal with the issue himself. And it took four days for Matreolus and Tarval to find what was left of the first body. That fat idiot got what was coming for him. The old man admonished him. Don't speak ill of the dead. The tunnel widened and heightened as they proceeded down it. Groaning, part from annoyance and part from exertion, Matreolus said, You talk just like Anklin, all high and mighty and sounding like you're better than me. Kid, one day you and I are going to have a long talk about humility. Tarval paused while he carefully stepped over a large stone that had been lurking in the shadows. And you aren't going to enjoy it. And don't compare me to Anglin. At least I have the wherewithal to show up when the alarm bell is ringing. Tarval was going to say more. He always enjoyed a good tirade. But his boot splashed in something. The old man halted, Matreolus following suit a second later, the minecart groaning into motionlessness behind them. The lad could see the dark crimson of blood soaking into the ground, turning dirt into mud. A severed arm lay in the middle of the mess. A bundle of gore fell from the ceiling and landed next to the arm with a wet slap. Matreolus' eyes drifted up. The centipede hanging above them was perhaps the largest he had seen, though it would have been by a small margin. Thirty sets of thin legs with sharp angles to their joints kept a segmented yet serpentine body in place. Two stingers arraigned to function like a pincher held human remains where jaws could gnaw meat off of bones. The glowstone on the minecart cast an eerie glow on a body that was as dark as midnight, yet seemed to soak in the light as opposed to glint it. It had no eyes, whispers hunted by smell and with their antennae, and with, if Tarval was to be believed, their minds. But the most striking feature of a whisper was its silence. Even as flesh-rending mandibles pulled meat from the bones of a human torso, not a single sound was made. Matreolus had encountered enough of them to know that only rarely did whispers make discernible noises. At least, not with their mouths. How do creatures with no ears stay so quiet? Tarval sighed. Kid, that one's big. Matreolus, unshaken, replied. We've got this. It wouldn't hurt to have Anglin with us. We can do it without that silver-haired bastard. Matreolus replied. Besides, if we back out to get him, Kenner and his men will never let us live this down. The antenna on the whisper started twitching. Matreolus had lived enough moments like these to understand what the monster was thinking. It was starting to come out of the focus spurred on by the rapid consumption of its prey. It was starting to smell both men beyond the invisible haze of blood that filled the tunnel. Looks like we're about to find out the hard way whether or not we've got this, Tarval muttered. Matreolus smirked, bringing up his longsword into a ready position. Oh, have a little faith. Why don't you have a healthy appreciation for the thirty-foot-long centipede on the ceiling? The old man growled. It'll serve you better than faith. The whisper relinquished its hold on the human torso it had been devouring. That mass of human bone and flesh splashed into the puddle of blood beneath it. And then the whisper began rearing up on its legs, giving the appearance that it was starting to hang down from the ceiling. Get ready, the old man said. Here it comes. The whisper moved fast. They always did. 
Tarval countered its lunge with a thrust of his spear, but the Whisper's stingers caught it by the shaft an inch behind the weapon's head. Matreolus saw his opening and tried to go in for the kill, but a long whip-like antenna slapped his sword aside and connected to his shoulder, staggering him back. Matreolus recovered quickly, but not as quickly as he would have liked. The Whisper and Tarval continued their tug-of-war over the spear. As the old man yanked with all of his might, the centipede released its grasp. Tarval fell onto his rear full speed, cursing. The lad knew what was going to happen next. Whispers went in for the kill by overwhelming their prey, by grappling with their forward segments. And the old man was in no position to defend himself from that kind of attack. Bringing his longsword back to a middle guard, Matreolus charged the Whisper, screaming. Both antenna whipped at him. Matreolus caught one on the edge of his sword, severing a foot off of it. The other went low, striking outside his left thigh hard enough to rip his trousers and split the skin beneath him. Again, Matreolus stumbled, and the whisper lunged for him, surging with a fluid motion. The lad shielded himself with his longsword, even as the whisper's momentum drove him to the ground, causing him to land squarely on his butt, protecting himself with the flat of his blade supported by one hand on the hilt and the other near the tip. Stingers and mandibles snapped and contracted, trying to rip their way through his blade to get to him. One scratch from those stingers, and Matreolus would feel half his body lance with fiery pain before becoming paralyzed. The old man got back to his feet, spear at the ready. Screaming, Tarval charged in, lifting his spear high so he could bring it crashing down on the whisper. His attack did not land true. The tip of his spear connected with the segmented body of the whisper, but did not go between the armored plates. The creature jerked under the impact, but took no wounds. Those mandibles kept snapping at Matreolus. One uninjured antenna began to whip at him, its thicker base swatting him on the head, the long, thin remainder curving over and striking him on his back. His tunic started tearing, his skin splitting. Matreolus tried to push back with all of his might, but only succeeded in pressing the flat of his sword into the Whisper's mouth. Those mandibles seized on his blade. The Whisper reared back as if to tear the weapon out of the lad's hands. Tarval let loose a second time with the spear, bringing it crashing down and at last striking true. The head of his spear pierced between two of the armored segments almost halfway down the Whisper's body. The Whisper's assault on Matreolus ceased. Those flesh-rending mandibles suddenly relinquished their grip on his longsword, and that uninjured antenna whipped at him one last time, striking him across the face. Matreolus was sent sprawling, barely keeping hold on his longsword. His cheek had been slashed open, and he was certain that the cheekbone beneath had been cracked. The whisper curled in on itself, its antenna whipping again, swiping Tarval aside. The old man lost grip on his spear and staggered back, his own brutish stubbornness keeping him standing. The whisper's mandible seized onto the spear just above the wedge, and, with a crunch of its jaws and a twist of its head, snapped the shaft and tossed it aside. Matreolus surged back onto his feet, but Tarval grabbed him and whirled him around shoving him into a run towards the seemingly distant entrance to the mine shaft. This one isn't going down easy, the old man shouted. We're dealing with this outside. The lad didn't argue. Behind them, the whisper thrashed about for only a handful of moments, trying to dislodge the spear point stabbed into its body. And then, it stopped. Matreolus understood the silence behind them. That whisper's mind was chasing them down the mine shaft, scratching at the backs of their psyches. Latent telepathy, Tarval had referred to it. He had tried to give Matreolus the explanation, but the lad only understood the basest part. Whispers could sense the fear of creatures near them, homing in on what they believed to be the easiest prey, or specifically tracking the people that royally pissed them off. That whisper surged into motion behind them. The minor wounds on Matreolus' body protested as he ran. Something in the back of his mind twitched. The tattoos around his left eye burned. You shouldn't be running. Matreolus ignored the voice, ignoring the nagging suspicion that something had always been wrong in the back corners of his mind, and ignoring the rampaging creature behind them. He wasn't entirely successful. I guess they aren't the only ones that go mad when they're hurt. Matreolus felt something akin to a bloodlust within himself. He couldn't stop thinking of ways to turn around and strike the whisper, surging into motion behind them. I think we've still got this, the lad shouted. Despite running at full tilt, Tarval still found a way to attempt to cuff Matreolus. Shut up and run! The old man took a deep breath and then bellowed out, Kenner! We're coming out, and the whisper's right behind us! They sprinted out into the open pit of the mine, 
and the whisper exploded out of the shaft a split second behind them. Sunlight blinded them as it washed over their bodies. Matreolus tripped, his momentum launching him into the air. He landed face down on the ground, scraping across the dirt, his sword leaving his grip. A barrage of crossbow quarrels flew over his backside. Matreolus heard them ricochet off the whisper. A loud but somehow soft hiss filled the air. The kind of sound made by gentle wind. It was the noise for which whispers were named. The hiss that they made when they had been enraged to the point of relentlessly hunting down and killing their prey. It was not heard with the ears, but instead with the minds of those around it. Matreolus lifted his head, spitting out a mouthful of dirt. With one hand, he braced himself against the ground. The other swiped the dirt from his eyes before groping for his longsword. Ahead, Matreolus saw Kenner and a dozen guildsmen monster slayers, grizzled professional killers armed with crossbows and bestowed with perpetual poor attitudes, all priming their weapons to loose another volley. They were turning in sync with the whisper. Matreolus followed their eyes, seeing the whisper pursuing Tarval on a ripple of blurred black legs. It'll be a cold, cold day in this godforsaken town before I let you take the old man for a meal. His fingers met the hilt of his sword, and Matreolus grasped it without hesitation. He was on his feet, and sprinting without another second passing. He ignored Kenner's barrage profanity, and didn't flinch as a second volley of crossbow quarrels flew past him, again doing nothing to even slow the whisper. Matreolus managed one reckless burst of speed, catching up to the whisper. With both hands on the hilt of the sword, he swung his weapon. Matreolus easily lopped off a cluster of the whisper's legs. That loud hiss filled the minds again, the whisper ceasing its pursuit to thrash and scream. The creature lifted the front half of its body, swinging itself into the side of the mining pit. Dirt and fragments of stone sprayed from the impact. Smaller, four-legged bugs skittered out from beneath the whisper, newborns that clutched to their mother's underside for protection. And suddenly, Matreolus understood the whisper's aggressiveness and irrationality. At this point, she's just trying to kill to protect and feed her young. Kenner was shouting for his men to loose another volley, as if it'd have any more effect than the first two. Those cowards don't have good enough aim to hit it between the plates, and they sure as shit aren't brave enough to get in close. Tarval had tripped. The old man heaved breaths as he tried to push himself back up off the ground. Need to get its attention off of him. Matreola smirked. Well, he's going to call me an idiot no matter what I do, so I might as well make a spectacle out of it. He speared one of the infant whispers on the tip of his sword. Matreolus yelled and waved his sword, trying to make sure the whisper could catch the scent of its blood as it twitched at the end of his blade. The whisper noticed and turned, coiling its body for another sprint. Matreolus started to run, sprinting at Kenner, trying to get to the solid stone rock face behind him on the far side of the quarry. Kenner yelled, Don't lead it toward us, you damned fool! The squad of his crossbowmen started to scatter. It's wounded on the right side, Matreolus barked as he ran. Get out of the way and aim for that as it passes, and then hope that this works. Only half the monster slayers were able to do as Matreolus had shouted. Only Kenner and one other successfully hit their target. The whisper didn't slow. Matreolus continued his breakneck pace towards the wall, only to turn at the last second and dive to the ground sideways. He hit the dirt with a roll and found himself nestled between the ground and the foot of the quarry wall. Matreolus immediately scrambled to get further out of the way. The whisper pounced. Unable to see with eyes, it collided head first with the wall at full speed. The impact cracked the segments on its head. Matreolus got back to his feet, looking over his shoulder and expecting to see the whisper dead behind him, its brains dashed out against the wall. Instead, what he saw was the creature recovering, coiling again for a second sprint. Oh, you're a tough bitch to kill, aren't you? He muttered before taking off running again. The whisper pursued him, perhaps slightly slower, but still single-mindedly. Matreolus' sprint took him out of the open pit of the quarry, into the narrow pass that led to the outside world. A massive set of open double doors led to the way to the only road to town. Workmen tasked with keeping passers-by out saw Matreolus and his pursuer coming and panicked. They worked in teams to begin easing those massive doors shut. No, 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 no don't, don't do that! Do that. The lad pushed himself with one last burst of speed, slipping past the double doors and out onto the main industrial road into and out of Cartfell, the nearest town. Workers stared. Wagons were waiting for the loads of stone, their drivers glaring with impatience. There was even a small cluster of travelers and townsfolk that had gathered for the chance they might get to see a spectacle. 
Matreilus heard the quarry's double doors grow shut behind him. He scarcely had the moment to dive to the right, bowling over a pair of workers, before the whisper came barreling over the doorway and then pounced. Its inertia carried it through the air, straight into one of the wagons. The driver just barely managed to evade, leaping off while his oxen panicked in vain. The whisper came to a halt, kicking up a mess of gore and splintered wood. It was, at long last, motionless. The cracked segments on its head had been further separated by the most recent impacts, and now a broken wagon wheel was lodged deep into what Matreilus assumed was the creature's brain. A mix of ox and whisper blood formed a wide and sticky puddle around the wreck. The infant whispers detached from their mother's underside and began scampering about the wagon, opportunistically picking at flesh while making soft, breeze-like sounds. Matreilus got off the ground and dusted himself off. He ignored the glares from the workers that he'd knocked down and yelled, Nobody panic! Everything is well in hand! He used his boot to push the infant whisper off his sword, leaving it to die in the dirt. Everything is well in hand! A hand seized onto his shoulder and spun him around. Tarval glared. You call it a display like that, well in hand? Matreila shrugged. The bug's dealt with now, isn't it? Tarval sighed. Kenner's going to kill us both. No, he won't. Matreilus offered a grim smirk. If he did that, he'd have to go into the tunnels himself. He keeps us around so that we do that for him. And hey, how'd you catch up with me so quickly? It wasn't hard, Tarval replied. I just had to follow the idiot with the sword making an ass out of himself. Matreilus clenched a hand into a fist. Last time I checked, what I did saved your life. Yes, Tarval said, and then you endangered everyone out here. I killed the damn thing. The damn thing killed itself. Tarval's glare was more than a match for the fury in his voice. And you had no idea whether or not it was going to survive that. What would you have done if it had kept going? You would have put everyone out here at risk. I'd have dealt with it. The wood groaned and creaked and cracked next to them. The whisper started to rise again. Its hiss filled their minds. People started to scream and run. Matreola shoved the old man back, bringing his sword to the ready. You want to see how I'd have dealt with it, old man? Then fine, shut up and watch. And then someone else joined the fray. Matreola saw something streaking from the edges of his vision. A black-haired swordswoman, with a blade like dark silver that reflected waves of indigo on its edge. She was between Matreilus and the Whisper before even a second could pass, and her sword flashed out but one time. Mandibles and stingers separated from the bottom of the creature's head and it came to a halt. Just as sudden as the first cut, she made a second, this one vertical. What was left of the Whisper's head was split in half, and the creature fell limp just in front of her boots. She flicked the blood from her blade and then returned it to its scabbard. So that's what all the commotion was about, she said, turning to face Matreilus and the old man. I take it that normally the job goes a bit smoother than that, correct? The swordswoman was rather striking. Her raven hair was kept in a long tail, and knowing green eyes were the most prominent feature of her heart-shaped face. But she was beautiful, despite the dust smeared on her face, breeches, and tunic. No doubt from long days and nights spent trekking the long and lonely roads between the towns and cities in the Badlands. Her breeches were the utilitarian sort, chosen for their durable fabric. She had a pack on her shoulders that looked overstuffed, and yet she's nimble enough to be moving like that. Matreilus recovered from his shock. No doubt Tarval had as well, but the old man was taking the time to gawk at the kind of woman that didn't exist in Cartvel. You shouldn't have done that, Matreilus groaned. Tarval recovered at last and cuffed him. What the lad meant to say was, thank you for promptly and deftly saving our asses. Well, yeah, but Kenner... The woman was smirking, as if bemused. Who's Kenner? Her eyes were lingering on Matreilus, staring at the tattoos around his eye. A voice like thunder boomed out of the quarry. Where the hells did that thing get to? And where the hells are those two amateurs at? Matreilus knew that Kenner wouldn't be far behind, stomping out in his boots with a foul look in his eyes, grimace on his lips and crossbow in hand. Today's spectacle would leave him less inclined to negotiate than normal. Matreilus and Tarval both turned uneasy eyes to the entrance to the quarry. That's Kenner, Matreilus sighed and looked to the swordswoman. You got a name? Stiaria Adervin, she replied. Some concern had edged into her voice, but she still sounded almost amused. 
What's going on? Short version, Matralis explained. Kenner and his men are guildsmen that are supposed to deal with the Whispers, like that one you'd put down. But they're cowards, so they pay us to do it for them, and we get half the Slayer's fee. But you killed it, and Kenner doesn't like it when arrangements don't go as planned. So there might be trouble, Stiaria finished. Aye, Matralis said. So, Stiaria, you might just want to keep a hand on your sword, just in case you need it. You two are going to make things worse, Tarval groaned. How do you think he's going to react, seeing the three of us looking like we're ready for a fight? Hopefully he'll act like a coward and back down, and then give us our damn money. Kenner came stomping out of the quarry, his posse of guardsmen only a half-step behind him, shoving his way through the slowly opening double doors to the mines. He came to a stop about ten feet away from Atreilus, Tarval, and Stiaria, crushing an infant whisper under his foot without even noticing. Kenner kept his crossbow aimed at them, holding it at the hip. His men lined up to either side of him, the butts of their crossbows braced firmly against their shoulders. I paid you idiots to kill a whisper, not wreck the whole damn quarry. You're exaggerating, Tarval said flatly. Your guild should easily be able to cover the damage. It'll come out of what I get paid, Kenner replied. Just like what I pay you comes out of what I get paid. He jostled his crossbow. Maybe it's time I say I've had enough of paying you what I could be keeping for myself. Matreila snickered. You're not going to do that. Tarval tried to cut him off. Kid, that's stow it, old man. Matreilus grunted before raising his voice back to Kenner. You're not going to do that. If you kill us, and we might take you with us if you try that, then you'll be dealing with the whispers yourself, probably while missing an arm, a leg, or both. Kenner was quiet, mulling things over in his mind while leering and scowling at the three of them. Then he bent his right arm, pointing the crossbow straight up and hefting it. His men lowered their weapons. Kenner, with his newly freed left hand, took a small coin purse and sent it to Matralis' feet with an underhand toss. There's your slayer's fee, Kenner grunted. Now how about you numbskulls get out of the way? Us guildsmen have a mess to clean up. Matralis sheathed his sword and stooped to pick up the coin purse as Kenner and his men turned to head back into the quarry. One of those slayers loosed his crossbow, spearing another infant whisper. Matralis made an obscene gesture at their backsides. Tarval promptly cuffed him on the back of the head. The lad opened the coin purse and dumped some of its contents into his hand, relieved to see genuine free guilds coins in his palm. He'd learned to check the coins after every deal when once Kenner had tried to swindle them with counterfeits. Matreilus dumped the coinage back into the coin purse, then gave a curt nod to Tarval. He paid us well. Let's go. The lad and the old man had both barely managed to turn before Stiaria cleared her throat behind them. Both looked at her and she smiled sweetly and patted the hilt of her sword. I helped, did I not? Matreilus and Tarval both nodded. Then don't you think I might deserve a cut of that? Stiaria's smile shrank to a smirk. I did save your lives, after all. Please, I had everything under control, Matreilus sighed. How much do you want? Half, Stiaria said, with the kind of confidence that would brook no negotiations. Matreilus didn't heed her tone. A third. A third? There's three of us involved, so the money goes three ways equally, Matreilus said flatly. You want a cut, you get the same cut as everyone else. A third. Styria sighed. Fine, I'll take a third. She stepped up and Matreilus diffied out her share of the coins. Styria quickly pocketed them, then gave both an expectant look. Can I ask a favor of both of you? I'm just passing through, but I'd like to know where I can get a good drink at. Matreilus and Tarval exchanged glances, then laughed. Hard. While the old man struggled for breath, Matreilus was able to say, You can get a drink in Karkvel, but it isn't going to be a good one. Tarval regained his composure. Crow's Nest is where you'll want to go. You'll be able to smell it from up the street. He sighed. This is a pretty backwater mining town, lass. The only people that drink at Crow's Nest are the people that need to drink. And that's people like us, Matreilus chimed in. And Tarval quickly added, Unfortunately... Stiaria's smirk never wavered. Well, could you show me the way there? I'd still like a drink, even if I have to reserve my expectations. Aye, Tarval grunted. We'll show you the way there. He led the way into town, grumbling to himself about getting too old for running around and slaying whispers in the mines. Karkvel was not a pretty town. Dust hung in the air, and filth could be spotted on the edge of the streets. 
The poorly paved roads were not well maintained. Only the merchant street that ran through the center of town had any semblance of decent paving. The rest of Cartville looked to be slowly collapsing, like wood rotting away. The difference between those well-off enough to do business with merchants and those who couldn't was obvious. Those people who were the former always gawked at Matreolis and Tarval, the two workers in town brazen enough to not submit to the guilds. I hate the way they look at me, like I'm just some kind of pest not allowed to walk whatever street I please. They paid Stiaria no mind. To them, she was just another traveler. The trio took a turn off the main road, leaving the Merchant Street in its mediocrity for something far worse. Shops were replaced by a jungle of slums, expanding all the way out to the edge of town. Shanties and tenements dominated the view. Destitute townspeople cluttered the streets. Did we take a wrong turn? Stiaria asked. Nope, Matrealis chuckled mirthlessly. Welcome to Lowtown, the only part of Cardfell that the guilds haven't gotten a stranglehold on. You two live here, in this kind of mess. Tarval grunted noncommittally. We've got a lot on the edge of it. It's a nicer spot. Fairly well separated from the rest of the slag heap. You choose to live in a place like this. Petraeus couldn't tell whether Stiaria sounded confused, curious, disgusted, or all three. I was born here, Matreolis said. You just kind of get used to it after a while. Many of the destitute regarded Stiaria with curt glances. Travelers seldom came into Lowtown, and never had any of them traveled in the company of Matreolis and Tarval. The old man and the lad had a reputation that put them and another like them at odds with the rest of the slummers. It wasn't hard to find Crow's Nest. The smell of cheap liquor made it easy to find the street it belonged to. Foot traffic was lighter down that road, the people looking gruffer and less savory. Crow's Nest itself was a hideous building, one that offended the eyes. Slats were missing from the walls. Part of the building looked as if it had at one point been set aflame. It even sagged, looking as though it might one day simply collapse. Stiaria sighed. Looking at the rest of this place, I can't really say I'm surprised. Is it even safe to enter? The old man grunted. It hasn't fallen over yet. Matreola snickered. You know, the local bookies have a pool running on who'll be inside when Crow's Nest finally does decide to die. You wouldn't be laughing if you knew your odds, Tarval said. Oh, I know my luck, Matreolis countered, stepping to the door and opening it. I'll still be standing in the rubble when the damn place fought. He tripped over the threshold and went crashing down onto the dirty floor of the tavern. What was that about luck? Stiaria laughed as she stepped over him, Tarval a second behind her. Matreolis muttered a few curses as he pushed himself up off the ground. Catching up to the other two, Tarval chided him, saying, one day you'll be able to keep your big mouth from bringing you down. Until then, well, you'll just have to keep being good at picking yourself back up. Stow it, old man. Matreolis shook his head. And out of the corner of his eye, he saw her. She was pretty, a young woman with long brown hair and green eyes. She stood out for two reasons. First being that Matreolis had never seen her in Crow's Nest before. And second, she had a cold glare. Less like she was there for a drink, and more like she was searching for something or someone, and an unexpected obstacle had just shown up. In either case, it didn't much matter. She got up and left, Matreolis' eyes following her as she stepped outside. Hey kid, you gonna come sit down with us, or is it more comfortable for you to just stand there gawking? Matreolis turned, making his way to the table in the back corner of the tavern. It was their usual spot to drink. Tarval and Stiaria awaited him there as did his other closest friend, Anglin. Anglin wasn't from the Free Guild's territories, or even from the Foss Taver Empire to the north. No, he was from a region far away, some silver desert called Amar Rolan. Anglin was a pretty man with an exotic look, thanks to his dusky gray skin and silver eyes and hair, the latter kept in a long, tapering tail that reached all the way down his back. Though he may have been a foreigner, Anglin was one of the most stalwart friends Matreolis could lay claim to. Beyond that, Anglin was a fearsome swordsman. Everything he had learned, Matreolis had figured out by copying Anglin, who, on a normal day, usually accompanied them on their hunts for whispers in the tunnels beneath the quarry. Anglin, you picked a hell of a job to sit out on, Matreolis said as he took a seat. That might have been the biggest whisper we've seen so far. Anglin offered the two of them a smirk. I see you managed it without me. 
And who's your new friend? This is Stiaria, Tarval answered. She's probably the reason we survived today. And Stiaria, this is Anglin. He's our comrade, and usually our third on our team when we're hunting. Stiaria's smirk was a match for Anglin's. They got caught up arguing with each other and forgot to kill the thing when it was down. Sounds about right, Anglin said. When are you two going to learn to properly work together? We were working together just fine, Tarval sighed. If by working together you mean running for dear life and you almost getting yourself killed, then yes, we work together just fine. The three took their seats, Tarval to Anglin's left and Stiaria to his right. Matreolus, in his usual seat with his back to the room, was across from Anglin. The serving girl came to them. Crow's Nest served only one drink. It was a foul and cloudy mixture called grog. Usually a mix of whatever was lowest price that the merchants brought in, and a healthy dose of dirty water. She brought each of them a tankard with her usual lack of courtesy, and snarled silently at Matreolus when he thanked her. She's always in such a pleasant mood, Matreolus muttered, trying to disguise the chuckle in his voice. He knew that if she heard it, she'd turn around and give him an earful. Is this place always so... depressing? Stearia asked. Taral shrugged. Today is honestly one of the better days we've been in here this month. Usually it's a lot worse. Besides, this place beats having to drink at a guild establishment. We can't afford to pay guild prices, Matrilis chimed in. Especially not for drinks that use the same dirty water. The sad thing is that most people can't, Stearia said. I hear that everywhere I've been as of late. Welcome to the Free Guild's territories, Tarval groaned. Free to stay if the guilds don't choke the life out of you and your town. Anglin clapped his hands twice, softly. Enough of this talk, he said. We should be celebrating the triumphant return of our two most heroic monster slayers. Anglin failed to maintain a straight face as he spoke. I'm sure we'll all sleep well in our beds tonight, doing no small part to your efforts. Shut up. Matreolus growled after taking a long draught from his tankard. I hate it when you get smug. Tarval finished his own gulp of grog, then added, For once today, lad, I think we are agreed on something. So is this what you three do, then? Staria asked. Fight those monsters and try not to die. Most days, yes, Matreolus said. Of course, most days are much less exciting, Tarval added. Usually we have our esteemed swordsmen with us. What was that creature? Steria asked, sipping her grog and trying to suppress her winces at its overly sweet and cloying yet watery taste. We call them whispers, Tarval said. This town's got a lot of old tunnel formations all around it, and the things breed and hunt in and around them. We just keep them out of the mines. That sound they make? Right in your head, Tarval explained. Ever met a telepath? Stearia nodded. They can do some of the same tricks, just not as well. Tarval took a gulp of his grog. Mainly, they just sense the minds of others around them, part of how they hunt. A couple hours passed in this manner. Tarval prattling about the specifics of whispers and how they hunt, Stiaria listening intently. Matreolus would chide in between gulps of his grog, making a joke or a comment that his two friends would quickly turn into a joke, usually at his expense. It wasn't long before daylight began to wane and Anglin finished his grog in a single long sip, then got to his feet. Well, that's enough drinking for today. Let's go home, and you two can tell me exactly what went wrong during your little hunt today. And you, Stiaria, are more than welcome to join us for the night, if you need a place to stay. I promise my two housemates will be on their utmost best behavior. Though I can't guarantee they won't continue to prattle between each other. He started towards the door, leaving behind a single silver piece on the table. It was the first time Atreus had seen him pay with such coinage. Tarval had noticed as well. The old man said, Anglin, that's enough money to pay for us all, and then some. So it is, Anglin replied, without looking back. Both Matreolus and Tarval finished their drinks and got back to their feet. The lad looked to Stiaria, and saw she had done the same. You coming with us? She nodded. I don't think it'd be smart for me to turn down a free roof over my head. And besides, you and your friends are fascinating. Matreolus offered her half a smile. Good, it'll be nice to have a fresh face around. They followed Anglin through the dusky streets of Cartville. Dust motes still hung in the air, accompanied by the stench of poverty. The local ne'er-do-wells quickly parted from their paths, however. A few criminals had tried their luck with Anglin and had died. 
more than a few had tried their luck with Tarval and Matreolus, and the old man and the lad had given them all enough injuries to keep the local physicians well-fed for years. When the three moved together, the street toughs went to great efforts to stay out of their way. And now, Matreolus thought, there's a fourth one to our number. Those low lives must be shitting themselves right now. A short walk brought them all back to the merchant district, to Anglin's home. It was a small estate, a decent wall cutting it off from all its shabby surroundings. A wooden gatehouse brought them inside to a trio of buildings. A bathhouse, a common room building, and a dormitory of sorts. It was all relatively well kept. As Anglin pulled aside the wooden gate to reveal it all to them, Stearia asked, How do you even manage to live in a place like this? We've long been asking the same question, Tarval replied, his arms crossed. I have my ways, Anglin smiled. Matreola snickered. As pretty as you are, Anglin, I wouldn't be surprised if you were selling yourself on street corners when we aren't looking. Those are not my ways, Anglin said, diplomatically. He shook his head and looked at Stearia. Welcome to our home. You may stay as long as you wish. 